Uh, the reality is uh, founding a company is going to be the most rewarding, the most fulfilling thing that you ever do, but it's also going to be the hardest thing you ever do, the most challenging thing you ever do, and the most emotionally taxing thing you ever do. Um, and having a, a network of um, like-minded people that are going through the same experience um, and can uh, support you and challenge you and help you along this uh, arduous but rewarding journey, I think is 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 the biggest uh, the biggest reason to join. Uh, welcome to the SaaS Revolution Show, uh, Philippe Pateri and Varun Purandari uh, from Axel. Uh, welcome both. Hi, Alex. My pleasure to be here. Great, great to have you. Uh, great to have you on, uh, on the podcast. I think this is only probably the second or third podcast where we've had more than one person uh, uh, on the the SaaS Revolution Show. Uh, but both of the uh, the previous ones have been uh, have been excellent uh, and great sort of like levels of interaction. So looking looking forward to this. And this is a a SaaS Euroscape special uh, because it's that time of year uh, as we move into Q4 and uh, and autumn uh, when the annual uh, Axel SaaS Euroscape uh, 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 is presented and uh, at SaaS Um So we're getting a bit of uh, insight and teasers uh, into that uh, uh, today before SaaS Lockamia, which is happening on the, the 12th to the 14th. Um, so super excited to... Uh, to get some uh, insights on what's happening uh, uh, this year uh, in SaaS in Europe. Um, before we get into it, though, uh, let's have a quick intro uh, for both of you, um, uh, for those uh, that are listening that uh, don't know uh, anything about you. Um, what's one fun, you know, tell us about yourself and what's one fact that we may not know about you? Philippe, why don't you start? Hi, well, uh, thank you, Alex, for inviting us to, to the show today. and. Uh, very excited. We have been working hard in the, the past few weeks on the 2021 edition of the Eurscape, and uh, the findings are quite uh, quite extraordinary this year. And, and we look forward to uh, presenting them to the audience uh, in a couple of weeks. So, I'm Philippe Botteri. I'm a partner uh, with Excel, based in our London office. I've been in venture for the the past 15 years. Um, so, the, a lot of my work has been around. Um, cloud computing in, and SaaS. So in my uh, before joining Excel, um, I started my uh, um, venture career with uh, Bessemer Venture Partners. So that was in, in 2006 in the Valley. So it was really at the time where uh, the burst of, of SaaS, that was a time where, you know, you basically had to convince people that, you know, cloud was not a fad. Uh, and so this gave me the, the chance to invest in, in Gen 1 uh, SaaS companies like Cornerstone On Demand, Eloqua or Intag. And then since uh, I joined uh, Excel in um, 2011, I've, I've um, you know focused a lot of my time looking for uh, cloud companies born in Europe. Uh, it's been incredible to see the how this ecosystem has grown in the past 10 years. And so I've been uh, fortunate to uh, you know to invest and work with company like you know UiPath on the automation side. Um, Chainalysis, uh, which is a, a crypto forensics company, um, Doctolib uh, in France, which, which is uh, no printing systems for, um, you know, for doctor. Uh, they're now expanded in, in other European countries. Um, also work um, also on the board of a company called Snake, which is a leader in, in developer first um, security. Uh, and and several others. So uh, you know, it's been for me a privilege to be part of um, you know this European cloud ecosystem uh, for the, the past ten years. Um, so yeah, I mean, a quick uh, fun fact uh, about myself. I think well, one of the things I really like to do is I, I like to spend time on uh, on boards, uh, but not uh, company. But I like company boards, but I also like other kind of boards. So I've been uh, I'm a, a surfer. A snowboarder and it used to uh, to skate as well. And I think what one of the fun facts is that in 2006, so right before I started my career um, in, in venture, when you know I left McKinsey and took a week off, went to Hawaii and surfed uh, a big waves for a week with uh, Tarek Donner, uh, who's one of the, the pioneer of um, Hawaiian big big wave surfing. And uh, and now I have the the surfboards in my uh, in my office uh, in London at Excel. Amazing. Thanks for sharing this. Maybe I'm too much of a, a, a wuss, uh, but when I think of like surfing in Hawaii, first thing that comes into my mind is sharks. And maybe I, I, I shouldn't do that, but uh, perhaps not, not so much of a problem. 
Well, I, I was more scared by the, the size of the wave than the sharks. <laughs> sharks feel like a different problem, like you're more focused on surviving in the waves. <laughs> Good, good stuff. Well, maybe any problem where, like, thinking about surviving, whether it's sharks or waves, I just keep myself in the comfort of uh, uh, of my house, or maybe, or maybe I should be more adventurous. But what about yourself, Aaron? Um, tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and a fun fact uh, also. Absolutely, and and thanks again, Alex, for for having us on the show. Um, so, like Philippe said, uh, you know, frankly, you know, Philippe used the example of uh, you know how. Uh, cloud and, and SaaS has evolved uh, in the last 15 years. Uh, and I've been in venture now uh, for the last nearly four years. Uh, and just seeing the sort of burst of companies um, and, and the growth in the ecosystem in these last two or three years has been frankly amazing. Um, like Philippe, funnily enough, uh, I also uh, started out my venture career with a brief stint uh, at Bessemer and then uh, have been with Excel uh, for the majority of it, for the last uh, three and a half years. Um, in terms of a fun fact uh, on myself, um, so I actually played tennis at a state level and briefly at a national level growing up as a kid, uh, but soon realized I was I was no no Federer, no Nadal, and uh, eventually gave that up uh, to, to pursue uh, my studies. Um, so you know, whenever I do get a chance in London, uh, I'm I'm always uh, game to play. Great stuff. Well, uh, we're talking about the Axel SAS Euroscape today, as we say, which is coming up at, at SAS Alchemia. And uh, Philippe, this is going to be the, the sixth year uh, now, I believe, that's, uh, that you're presenting this and revealing this uh, at SAS which we're, we're, we're honoured uh, for. So when are you uh, presenting? You, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, tell us a little bit more, um, again, for those that haven't heard of the, the Axel SAS Euroscape. Yeah, I mean, I think just go, going back to uh, uh, my history in venture, I mean, when I started in venture, I really, uh, in the US, you know, really focused a lot of my time on, on you know, cloud and SaaS, you know, and that period, you know, 2006 to 2011, that's where basically the ecosystem started to get, um, you know, created and, and gaining momentum. Um, in the US. And then at, at this time, you know, I started to see something happening in Europe, investing in a company called, you know, Criteo, which originated from France, ended up being listed on the NASDAQ. So I, I saw that something was happening in Europe at the time. And then what, when I got the, the call from, uh, from Excel, I mean, it was a global platform. And I think that was super important for me because, you know, I had, you know, the, the strong conviction that to be successful in venture, um, I mean, you need to back global companies and to back global company, you need to be global ourselves and be able to give them like the, the full benefit of, uh, of a, a global network. Um, and so I'm, I love the, you know, the, the partners that I met there and decided so in 2011 to, to go back to, to Europe. And one of my big question when I move is like, you know, I like invest to invest in cloud companies, but what is really the, you know, how many cloud companies, you know, did you have in, in 2011? In, uh, in Europe. And, and the answer was, you know, unfortunately not that many. So I, I, I you know, when I started in Europe, several of my initial investments were um, in, in marketplaces, you know, like, you know, Bladlacar and, and uh, in France, you know, Fiverr um, in Israel. And then in, you know, in 2013, 14, that's where we started to see the first, you know, cloud companies starting to emerge um in europe and you know my first investments in a cloud company in europe was people dark in 2014 then 2015 was you know dr lib in algolia so i started to see at that time that something was really starting to to happen and then in 2016 i said well you know we have to put europe on the map um the, the european cloud ecosystem on the map um and, and that's when i say okay well let's take stock of where we are in 2016 and and let's talk about, you know, these companies that are emerging because no one was doing it and everyone's saying, you know, software companies are all from the US. Uh, and I didn't think that this was true because I was, you know, seeing something um, in, in Europe. And that's why we, you know, at Excel, we started the, the Euroscape and kind of say, well, let's create this list of the top 100 companies out of Europe and Israel and, and show um that that europe and israel are actually active in the global cloud ecosystem um and you know at, at the time in 2016 a lot of questions of the journalists were around well can europe generate you know a billion dollar software companies because it, you know that never happened in, in the past 
um, and that sounds um, I mean, it sounds interesting because if you look at you know just in 2020 there were 25 um, you know European and Israeli cloud unicorn, uh, including UiPath, which was you know privately valued you know at the time north of you know 10 billion, uh, and Europe last year had generated more than 10 public companies. Um, so you know in the past five years so much has changed right and when you look at back at what was happening in 2016 and where we were last year like it seems night and day and just to give you an idea an idea of magnitude like in 2016 the euroscape the 100 euroscape winners had raised 2.5 billion dollars if you look at the same number in 2020 it was 14 billion so it's like 6x growth in in five years so it, it, you know we've seen an exponential growth uh, of the the ecosystem seems have radically changed and uh you know and, and for me like I, I can't be happier than that because you know looking back at this you know 2013 14 days we're like well you know something's gonna happen we feel it but we you know really want it to happen and today we look back and say well now it has really happened and so if we look at the you know the 2021 edition and, and what we've been working on you know in the past uh, week with uh with Varun um so we'll basically look back at what happened in the past year in the you know public and, and private cloud market um you know what what was interesting is last year so we we focused the title on decacorn call it decacorn unleashed because that was the first time that actually there was uh you know private cloud decacorn emerging from uh from europe with with uipath i think this year we're going even you know two steps forwards by asking the question Really, is Europe on track for global dominance uh, on cloud and SaaS? Uh, yeah, I mean it's a bold statement, a bold question, but you know we'll go through the data and uh, we'll let the audience judge if we are too bold uh, or not. The other thing we'll do is like we'll dive into the, the different hubs um, and see you know which one has been you know growing faster or slower, and in particular I'll do a specific zoom on, on Israel, which has been uh, super high performing in um, you know in, in the, the past year. So all this will be presented live at SAS SAS Talk on um, October twelfth. Exciting! I'm looking forward to either uh, hearing the answer or making up my own mind on whether Europe is on track for uh, for global dominance. And uh, um, yeah, I mean uh, from what we've seen, uh, I think over the last couple of years, it could be. But let's let's wait until the twelfth to make up our own minds. And uh, Varun. Like, what does it mean for a SaaS company to make the, the Euroscape 100? Yeah, no, that's a good question, Alex. But, um, you know, before, before I answer that question, it's worth um, just spending some time uh, explaining the methodology we use in order to get to the Euroscape uh, 100. Um, so the universe of companies uh, that we consider are the ones, of course, that apply to us. And as uh, I'm sure the audience here has seen, um, you know, the application that, that has been out, um, you know, to apply uh, to be part of the Euroscape. But then separately, we also do um, a detailed mapping of all the cloud companies in Europe and in Israel that have more than a million in revenue and that have not become unicorns yet. So that is the subset of companies that we really hone in on uh, and focus on to try and identify uh, you know, which are the, the next breakthrough companies um, uh, coming out of uh, Europe and Israel. Some of the factors um, we look at include, you know, is the market that they're in attractive enough? Is that a growing category? Um, what is the differentiation, both from a commercial as well as, well as a technological point of view uh, for these companies that we're considering? We look at the team, uh, we look at momentum, whether it's, uh, you know, from a revenue point of view, as well as from uh, growth in employees, because that's often an indication of, of uh, you know, how well the company is doing. Uh, and then finally, we also look at customer reviews. At the end of the day, uh, it's the end customers that really matter. And, and we use our partners at G2 uh, to help us identify which of the companies uh, that customers are talking most positively about. So, so we use all uh, you know, these criteria to come up uh, with that list. And, and it's a difficult exercise and it's, it's not perfect. And each year it gets, uh, you know, tougher and tougher uh, to decide. Uh, and that's, you know, partly due to what Philippe just mentioned, which is uh, just the explosion and exponential growth of, of the cloud ecosystem. Um, but to come to your question uh, that you posed earlier, uh, what does it mean for companies uh, to be part of the Euroscape? So, so first and foremost, um, you know, 
being part of the list uh, is a great recognition, um, uh, you know, it, and it has great benefits. So it serves as a lead gen uh, for a lot of these companies. Uh, the report, thanks to you and, um, you know, thanks to, uh, you know, companies themselves popularizing the report, uh, it's, it's widely circulated. Uh, and it's used by companies uh, to choose, uh, you know, which products they should go with. Um, so, so that's definitely uh, a key factor that helps companies on the Euroscape. Um, it also provides great visibility into just what's happening in the venture tech ecosystem. And, and you know, we've heard a lot of companies uh, receive calls from, from investors, uh, you know, when they've been featured uh, in the Euroscape 100. So I think that's also a, a key factor. Uh, and finally, I mean, a high percentage of the winners that are part of the Euroscape Top 100 eventually, you know, make it to unicorn status. So we'd like to believe that, uh, you know, if you do make it on that list, uh, you're in a elite group uh, and you're well on your way, um, you know, onto the path uh, to success and uh, not only unicorn, but but hopefully beyond. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and, and so if you get... Uh... Uh, within the cloud 100 and you, you make it to kind of this year's list uh, and on the October the 12th you see a number that you don't recognize it could be an investor that's just seen the uh, the, the list that's uh, that, that's calling to in invest in the next round potentially or it could be somebody chasing debt so uh, you never know you have to play, uh, play really the former. Yeah. Uh, good stuff well Philippe what are some of the key learnings that the SASTOC Amir attendees will get from this uh, that they could they possibly apply to their business? I think well, when you're a founder um, of a cloud business, I mean, we know it, it's it's very hard. It requires a 200% uh, commitment, and it doesn't leave you much time to to understand the, the broader the broader ecosystem and the areas that are not really core to to your business. And that's what the the Euroscape is meant for. It's meant to provide kind of a detailed view of the state of the cloud community uh, globally and with a you know big zoom on uh, on Europe. So we we hopefully think that this will give founders a different perspective on what is happening in the ecosystem, and it will make them think about you know what success look like and gives them new perspective on what could make their company even more successful. So that, that's what we are we are trying to to do here, and and of course uh, they will learn if their company made it to the um, uh, 2021 Euroscape Top 100 uh, list. Uh, Varun, a few years back, you called out London, Paris, and Tel Aviv as the main European tech hubs. Is, th is this still the case? Um, you know, is this still uh, important? Uh, you know, today, because I feel like we've seen a bit of decentralization of SaaS companies. Uh, having to be in Silicon Valley, certainly over the last few years. And, you know, are we still or are we seeing that, um, you know, with any of these three major hubs, uh, you know, are this is this decentralized decentralization happening and, you know, have the advantages gone? Yeah, no. So I think, uh, Alex, uh, decentralization is, is most definitely happening, um, you know, especially with what we've witnessed in the last uh, 18 months. Uh, you know, that's uh, you know, definitely unquestionable. Uh, but we actually think that, uh, you know, this is uh, one of the key strengths of uh, the European tech ecosystem. So in last year's Euroscape, um, out of the top 100 companies that we featured, these companies came from 34 cities uh, and 21 countries. So, uh, you know, if, if that's not decentralization, then I don't know what is. But um, and I think this this really goes back to. Um, the mantra that we believe in uh, at Axel, and, and that is that success can come from absolutely anywhere. Uh, and we see that, uh, you know, most definitely in the European ecosystem. Now, um, you know, to your point, uh, a few years ago, we had said that the likes of London, Paris, Tel Aviv, even Berlin, uh, uh, you know, are, are centers of talent. And, and we do think that they will be and will continue to be huge magnets um, for talent. Uh, and when this talent typically aggregates in, in one location, uh, like we've seen in these big cities, um, we see a cross-pollination of ideas uh, and several tangential benefits that, uh, that come out of having uh, so many folks uh, in one concentrated area. Now, um, given uh, the pandemic, I think it'll be really interesting to see how this new form of remote work, uh, distributed work, uh, will affect the dynamics uh, in these big cities. Uh, but, but alluding to what I said earlier, which is, you know, Europe is best placed uh, in many ways compared to other geos to handle this change. 
um, just given the nature of how a lot of the European companies were built pre-pandemic and, uh, and how a lot of them needed to have dual offices, whether it was one in the US, one in Europe. Um, so, so we're really, um, you know, positive that uh, this could be uh, an outcome uh, that, that Europe uh, and the companies born out of it uh, can take advantage of. Philippe, who, who are some of the, the rising stars in European SaaS? Uh, what is it about them that makes them uh, the rising stars? Sure. I mean, what, what is, uh, Alex, what, what is remarkable right now and that, you know, something we didn't see 10 years ago is that, you know, Europe and Israel have really proven that they can generate global category leaders. I mean, it's interesting because if you look at, um, you know, the, at, you know, the 2010, 2012 timeframe, a lot of the companies, tech companies emerging from Europe were uh, on the e-commerce marketplaces side and, there was a lot of talk about, well, all these European companies, they basically look at something successful in the US, try to replicate it in Europe, and they were like the so-called, you know, copycat. Um, and, and in software, obviously, you, you can't do that because software is more global by, uh, by nature. Uh, and so if you want to be meaningful in software, you have to create your own category. You have to be uh, a, a category leader and, and you have to be a global category uh, leader. And, um, and it's been very exciting to see that actually in, in the past few years, Europe has been able to generate these cloud giants, uh, which are worth now, you know, several billion dollars. I mean, from UiPath and Celonis and enterprise automation, um, you know, hoping for a virtual event platform, Snake, which is uh, the leader in that first security. We're, we've seen like how Europe have really been at the forefront of uh, cloud innovation and to me that's uh, super exciting so I, I understand like obviously you're, you're anxious to hear about you know who are the the companies we're going to unveil in uh you know in the 2021 euroscape but unfortunately the the listeners will have to wait uh a couple more weeks for that but i, I can share some of the the traits i think which um uh highlights uh, the, the 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 winners i think the the first one is that these are companies that are addressing a very large market, which is ripe for, uh, for dis disruption. I mean, they are building uh, a platform which basically addresses a pretty wide range of customers across size, across verticals. Um, and, and that's, I think, one of the, the first characteristics. The, the second one is the relentless focus of these companies on making the perfect products on making a product that is really loved by customers and really differentiated uh, versus competition. Um, you know, I think this focus on products, uh, especially at the early stage of the company, but not only even, you know, it matters a lot as you scale because that's gonna, that's what's gonna drive your, your net retention rate over time. Um, so that's really a, a key attribute. Um, you know, the, the third one I think is, is timing. Uh, you know, you don't have to be right, but you have to be right at the, the right time. And usually um, there is an inflection point in a market uh, which kind of drive the adoption. I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, kind of COVID was adding inflection point for, for Zoom, right? Something that drastically changed uh, the curve of, um, uh, of your growth. And there is obviously a bit of luck for that, but there's also a bit of... Um, you know, strategy, because, you know, if you, you may be right, but then if the market is not here, it's all about building this, you know, evangelizing the market and, and waiting until the time is right to really start to invest heavily in, in your, your, your go to market. And uh, the last one, uh, but obviously the most important, I think it's all about the, the founding team and, and their global ambition. Um, you know, I think uh, what has really changed uh, in, in the past few years in Europe is that now founders, they don't just don't want to create a company for their country. They want to create a global winner, a global company. And, and we've seen the level of ambition of the European entrepreneur really rise, um, you know, exponentially with uh, with the growth of the, the ecosystem in, uh, in the past few years. So all these are kind of the, the characteristics that uh, many of the winners on the list uh, share. Awesome. And there, there seems to be like the market seems to be really healthy in, in terms of like a lot of capital uh, right now, um, uh, a lot, lot of money going in. And uh, is it true that, you know, VCs can't deploy 
this fast enough. Uh, Philippe, what are your thoughts around that? Well, I mean, what, what is uh, true right now that there is a lot of capital on, on the market. And I think that opens uh, basically uh, new opportunities for all the companies who have access to, to this large pool of, of capital. I think one of the things as we were doing our you know, portfolio uh, reviews, um, you know, a few weeks back and we we're like, wow, you know, now this, a lot of our companies have on their balance sheet more than the size of our fund. Uh, and, and this is something that, you know, if you picture five, six years ago was like, you know, five, six years ago, a 70 million dollar round was, was a very big round. Now, as I was talking to a journalist yesterday, like if you raise a hundred million dollar, you don't even know if you're going to make the news because there are so many of them. Uh, happening these days. And so what this is, I think this is very important because now companies, when you have, you know, two, three, four hundred million dollars on your balance sheet, I think your perspective are completely different. Uh, let me give you uh, one, one example. Um, you know, a, a lot of the, the you know, what one company starts to mature, um, you know, and get into that, you know, hundred million dollar revenue range, um, the way to drive your net retention rates and, and grow your existing core is all is obviously by uh, you know continuing to develop uh, new products and, and integrate them in your uh, in your platform. And that's how you drive upsells. I think in the past, um, all the roadmap for SaaS and cloud companies was organic. Uh, so it was all about you know kind of hiring talents and, and kind of building. Um, building this new feature and new capabilities on your platform internally. But now I think the world has changed uh, because with 400 million or 300 million dollar on your balance sheet, now you can think about making acquisition and and buying a company for 50 or 100 million dollar, knowing that part of it's going to be cash, part of it's going to be equity. But if the largest round you have raised is a 70 million dollar round, putting 30 million for an acquisition doesn't sound like a, a very smart choice. But if you've raised 400 million, then putting 30 million in acquisition is of cash, you know, it's probably a no brainer because that means you can acquire a product that you can integrate in your platform and it's a good fit. You can upsell it very quickly to, to your customers. So this is really changing um, the dynamics of the, you know, the growth of, uh, of these companies. I mean, just to give you a couple of examples, um, you know, Snick has made several acquisitions. Um, you know, including Force ID and, and DeepCode. Uh, Algolia announced the acquisition of, of Morpho uh, several months ago. So we're seeing more and more of this, you know, kind of late stage uh, cloud companies making this acquisition to really accelerate the, the development of, um, of their roadmap. Uh, and that's something that, you know, didn't really exist um, in the past. But just to get back to your question, I mean, yes, there is a lot of money flowing into the ecosystem. Uh, but what I can tell you is that the investment pace is also accelerating for VCs and there is no sign that VCs cannot deploy money. I mean, if anything, if you look at the pace at which the, the funds are deployed today, I think they tend to be shorter than they were um, two or three years ago and, and the size of the funds seems to be bigger. So uh, I think if VCs had trouble deploying money, uh, that's not the dynamic that you would be observing today. But it's, it, uh, Varen, I mean, is there an issue? Because I've heard, you know, on a few podcasts or you know, on social media, you know, about all this money, which is, you know, flowing into the market. But because of that, uh, not enough due diligence going on in some cases. Uh, is this something you're seeing? You, you know, is, that, is this an issue? So, you know, Alex, uh, to what Philippe said earlier, I mean, the investment base has definitely stepped up. Things are moving faster. Um, but at least, you know, we can, I can speak for, for Excel and I can tell you that, you know, in anything we do, the DD is often done upfront. So while earlier, you know, you could take your time, get to know the team, uh, often in this market, uh, you know, even before you have your first call with companies, um, you know, you have to do a lot of diligence on the market, uh, ahead of time. Um, you know, at Excel, we have a concept called, uh, that of the prepared mind, uh, and what this, this method or, or methodology is, is. Um, you know, how we approach opportunities, learn about markets, uh, and then eventually invest in them. Um, and to just summarize, uh, you know, what uh, I mean when I say prepared mind is, um, at Excel, what we're trying to do is hone in on specific categories and industries that we think are interesting or are going to become the categories of the future. 
uh, be proactive in terms of tapping uh, our personal network uh, as well as uh, you know our expert network, um, researching trends uh, that are shaping these industries. Um, you know, really understanding what step changes occurred, whether it's something related to technology or another discovery that's really caused uh, the market to inflect. Um, and then really then after we've done that work uh, and we're positive on, on, on the broader space, it's really about finding that category leader. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, this goes back to, uh, you know, is this the product that's the defining product? Is this the team that has the global ambition? Uh, and then once you've done some of this work, then it's about moving fast. Uh, so it's not moving fast just for the sake of it, uh, because, you know, you see something's hot or, you know, others are moving, but it's more about having the conviction uh, beforehand. And that can only be done with, uh, you know, doing the work beforehand. Uh, and then going really fast at opportunities. So, so that's what at least we see, um, uh, you know, from, um, you know, in these last sort of 12, 18 months, uh, that's what we're seeing from our lens. Well, I, I for one, uh, cannot wait for this year's, uh, I, I guess, kind of like presentation and report. Um, really excited to see it. Varun, what's a, like a final plug to the audience that are listening uh, and watching uh, on YouTube? As to why they should tune in on October the 12th uh, uh, at this uh, year's SAS Nokamia to see the Axel Cloud Euroscope. Yeah, and we're excited as well. Um, you know, as, as Philippe said, we're, we've set out to ask the question, uh, is Europe on track uh, for global dominance? Uh, and as you'll see in our report, uh, we make a few uh, bold predictions. We back it up with data, uh, but we're also really looking forward to uh, questions from your listeners and from the audience. So. So tune in to SaaS Talk on uh, October 12th, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, and we hope we're, you, know, you are as excited as we are uh, to present the findings. Awesome. Well, I can't wait. Thank you so much, Varun and Philippe, uh, for joining the SaaS Revolution show today, uh, giving us some insights as to what we can expect uh, on October the 12th. I'm looking forward to your presentation then. Um, great stuff. Well, thank you, Alex. And see you on the 12th. Thanks, Alex. See you then.